Welcome to episode three of Disrupting Death. My name is Sadie Mallon. I'm the producer of this podcast. And before we dive in, our team just wants to make a note that this episode was recorded on March 8th, 2023. Since this date, there have been changes to the made legislation that may not be alluded to in this episode by the hosts or Senator Wallen. With that said, let's disrupt some death. Hey, Carrie, we are speaking with the Honorable Pamela Wallen. Yes. Oh, this woman has done phenomenal advocacy and work promoting true choice for Canadians at the end of life. She was first appointed to the Senate in December of 2008, and she serves today as an independent senator. And when we speak to her, I have a feeling, having listened to her a few times, both at the World Federation for Assisted Dying and, you know, hearing her concluding thoughts when she's advocating for her bill on advanced requests, Bill S. 248? That's it. S248. She has been a member and a chair of the Senate's National Security and Defense Committee and an active member of both the Veterans Affairs Subcommittee and the Senate's Foreign Affairs and International Trade Committee. This is a woman who uh, goes for the details. Speaking of details, I think I need to add that I am a super sleeper and I had a bit of a wakeful night thinking about how we were going to talk with her today. Me too, because this was kind of a big deal for us. And I think this just speaks to who Senator Wallen is. She wants the best for Canadians. And on her website, she says, if you can't offer people a vision of what they should do, you won't be able to persuade them about the things they shouldn't do. And I think that Senator Wallen is a person who wants to make sure Canadians have choice. Agreed. Looking so forward to it. Me too. So let's get the conversation started. Excellent. Welcome, Senator Pamela Wallen. We are so very glad you could join us today. Can you begin, please, by telling our listeners about Bill S-248? Why this bill? And why this bill now? Well, this has been a long process since the Supreme Court first ruled on this in 2014. And then we, the Senate started to deal with this issue. So we had passed an amendment in the Senate calling for advance requests, and it was accepted across all lines in the Senate. We sent it off to the government and they rejected it and decided instead to put more of an emphasis on the question of mental illness as a sole underlying cause for access or reason for access to MAID. So I'm kind of with the public on this one, which is the general public by and large is so in favor of advanced requests. The numbers just keep going up. It would have been my preference to kind of lead with that issue because there is such strength. But after the government rejected the Senate amendment, then I felt that we just needed to keep at this particular issue. Now, simultaneously, the Joint Parliamentary Committee, of which I was a member, was also meeting and discussing this issue. But instead of waiting and doing things in a linear way, there's no reason we can't do two things at once. So we, I put the legislation forward and uh, colleagues are speaking to that issue now at this time, and we're hoping to get it to uh, committee in the next little while. Excellent. And, and you've spoken about this being such an important issue to the Canadians. So what are you hearing from the general public? Why do they care so much about the option of having advanced requests? I think it's just more part of our psychology than people realize. We've always, or for a very long time in our society and our culture had something called the DNR, a do not resuscitate. We have all sat in hospital rooms with mothers or fathers or loved ones or friends and and had them say, look, if I can't live my life the way I want to live it, if there's some drastic thing that happens in the course of surgery, then please don't 
I, I don't want to live bedridden without an ability to communicate, without an ability to move. I went through this with my father. He was always very, very explicit. These conversations were around our supper table. So it was that kind of approach. And I think that people just instinctively know that they don't want somebody that they love and care for to live in pain or to live a life that has no quality or does not afford them the human aspects of the life they've always had. So I think that's why the public is there. You know, I always kind of make a joke about this, which is, you know, politicians love a parade. This one is already formed. And I wish more of my colleagues would get to the front of that parade because uh, we could really be moving in a reasonable, safe and secure way and give Canadians what they need. That we've got a lot of aging boomers (laughs) <laughs> we do we do to deal with this either with their parents or with themselves so the time is is right I agree the time is right and I love that image of politicians leading the parade and so as a senator why is this so important to you and the role of being a senator and leading this kind of work Well, we are the house that is supposed to be more thoughtful. We don't come with our partisan patches on our arms. And our committee process has always been very different than the house committee process. You see it all the time where everybody uses the majority on one side or another to shut down debate. And it's it's really, it's frustrating. And oftentimes as someone who's part of this process, uh, a little embarrassing that we act like that over issues in this case of life and death. So I really do feel that the Senate is an appropriate place. Our committees are thoughtful. We have time to think and it allows us to wrestle an issue. And I think that that's what this, you know, putting forward my own bill on this while these other issues are unfolding simultaneously, I think just helps everybody think through the process The Senate tends to be a little older in terms of the age of its members than the House of Commons. So I think that, too, gives us maturity and real life experience. I mean, I came to this issue quite personally. My mother was an extremely intelligent, bright woman who was diagnosed Mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's. And my father, who eventually died of several kinds of cancer, as I mentioned earlier, we always spoke very frankly about this in our household. And both of them had said to me, we do not want to live a life that is not full and able when we can't recognize you kids, when we can't feed and clothe ourselves. That's that's not living. That conversation was there. And I think they gave my sister and I a great gift by being so honest and direct about it. But so made was not an option for either one of them. Real problems in rural Saskatchewan in terms of access. COVID's actually helped us a little bit on that front because they're now allowing us to do more things this way, Zoom meetings and whatnot, so that people will have a little better access to made assessors to go through that process. But it wasn't possible for either one of them. And I just vowed to myself that I did not want others to go through what we as a family went through, watching my mother, uh, you know, had she been conscious or aware, she would have done something about this herself. And I know that we have a lot of people doing that now who have Alzheimer's or other neurocognitive diseases that they don't want to get to the point where they can't give conscious consent anymore. So they take earlier action. And that is so profoundly sad that we put people in that circumstance. Agreed. Agreed. And I really appreciate what you're saying. And I'm hopeful, like you, that people are having these conversations earlier on. And like your parents gave you that gift of being frank and open and willing to have those conversations, that hopefully what we're seeing in the news, what we're hearing in terms of supports for the bill that you are moving forward, that people will engage in these conversations in different arenas. And because like you said, dying and death does not align by political parties. No, it really doesn't. And we do need 
almost it's like getting governments out of the way. You know, most of the action in this country has come from court decisions, uh, including the most recent where eligibility for MAID was not tied to your death being foreseeable. And so that has really moved us along. We've now got the province of Quebec putting forward legislation and specifically on advance requests. So there's lots of pressure. It's sometimes the federal governments that have so much on their plate lose focus. And, you know, here we are in the midst of this discussion now about asking for an extension when it comes to accessibility based on mental illness. That was to come into effect this month in Canada. Now that will be delayed for a year. But what that delay has also meant and the discussion around that, that it's kind of opened up the debate. And in many quarters, we're into relitigating the question of MAID rather than dealing with this specific issue. And that is just not helpful. It's just not helpful. Right, right. And and something you mentioned briefly is you're from Saskatchewan and I'm from Northwestern Ontario. And Carrie Lynn and I, of course, read your speech to conclude your thoughts on Bill S24 around advanced uh, requests. And you make reference to the accessibility of MAID. And we're not located close to major metropolitan cities, let alone Ottawa. And Audrey Picard has been known to say this, that access to a palliative approach to care is a postal code lottery in our country. So what needs to happen to ensure that medical assistance in dying, that made, isn't also a postal code lottery? Well, it is to a certain extent. As I mentioned briefly, at least COVID has allowed some of the discussion to go on via Zoom and other forms of technology. We put a lot of responsibility on the MAID assessors and the MAID providers. They are still subject to the criminal code of Canada. Mm-hmm. So they need to make sure in their heart of hearts and their brain of brains and their guts of guts that they are doing the right thing. I mean, these are amazing people who have taken this on and are trying to help us invent this process. So, you know, there's always federal provincial splits and all of this and provinces deliver care differently. But the rural urban thing is an issue and it is a problem in terms of even where you might ask for the procedure to be done. I remember having a conversation with somebody from my hometown and it was a couple long married and the wife had chosen maid, but he, the husband did not want that in the family home. He was totally supportive of her request, but he didn't want that the procedure to take place. That would be then his memory there. So quite creatively, they phoned the local funeral home and said, could we use your facility to, in fact, uh, avail ourselves of MAID? And the woman phoned me, we had a conversation, and I said, I don't see why not. And so people are finding ways around this so that you don't have to travel with somebody that's ill to a city. And I, I'm hoping in this discussion, because we're having the discussion simultaneously about palliative care, and that we have to look at this whole issue on a continuum, you know, of illness, and sometimes treatment, and sometimes cure, and sometimes palliative care, and you take different forks in the road. And then you also have to provide made as a choice for people. It's always a question of choice, but they should know it's there. And so I think that's what we're trying to do. It gives people time to think about this. You know, uh, we have all sorts of questions that we wrestled with at the committee too. What happens if your children all moved from Saskatchewan to BC and then you move and all of your requests and all the work you've done with the assessor is in one province and you're now somewhere else, you know, it's, it's kind of like the discussion around electronic health records. Like we have to kind of come into modern times exactly. here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Pamela, you've given us a little bit of a gift there because you helped us segue into your own podcast, No Nonsense, and your recent discussion with Dr. Stephanie Green. And I would like perhaps if you share with our listeners how you feel the questions that you're getting about Uh, vulnerable populations, about people, uh, particularly you said something in the podcast with Stephanie about a disability advocate perhaps taking a different stance or view on how they were seeing their inclusion in the MAID 
uh, discussions. Perhaps you could share that. It is really interesting because you have, well, all, there's no monolithic communities, any of this, you know, women, men as categories, it's all different. It's the same in the disability community. <clears throat> so there are those voices and we heard some of them at committee that are totally opposed to MAID and think that this is somehow an attack on those who are disabled. The counterpoint is, of course, a large part of the disabled community saying, we don't want to be discriminated against. We want access to MAID as well, should we choose it. Why would you deny us that? And it's very much the same with those who have mental illness, which is they're making the same case, which is if I was 29 and had cancer and it was stage four, you would let me do this. If I've gone through every form of treatment that I can imagine and nothing's working for me and I choose not to live my life this way, then we have to give people the same choice that every other Canadian has. And I, I just keep using the word because that's part of the misinformation that we hear around this, that somehow made will be forced upon people who are disabled or people who have mental illness or people who are on the low income scale or don't have a place to live or veterans. We asked repeatedly throughout our hearings when people came and made such allegations, we said, please substantiate it. Give us the evidence. Tell us where this happened. And believe me, we'll do something about it because any maid provider that says, oh, yes, you can have maid because you don't like your apartment is going to lose their license. And <laughs> yes, they will. Should, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a lot of safeguards built into this system. But a lot of that anecdotal commentary was not substantiated with facts. So we have to go with the views of the majority that we heard, which is please, like every other Canadian, we would like to be given the same access to this palliative care. Should we choose it? Perhaps palliative care followed by access to MAID, perhaps palliative care followed by a natural death. I mean, we want choices for people and we are in favor of choice on a whole lot of other issues in this country. And I think we should be on this one too. Nobody wants to impose it on anybody, but we don't want in the same breath to deny it to people because they have some other condition. Like that's yeah. just really not even remotely fair. And Canadians are asking for a true choice at the end of their lives. You touched on this idea of misinformation, and I would extend it to saying flashy headlines. And so as a former journalist, what's been your sense of the media's role in educating Canadians around MAID? Please don't get me started on that. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think it's just one of those issues, and there are several, but this is one of those issues where you cannot be dealing with it as a clickbait story. There's just way too much at stake. And I also find, I mean, I turned on the CBC the other day and heard some reporter giving his view of what had happened at the committee. It was just, it was like wrong on 14 counts. Now, you know, if you want to watch what goes on in committees, and this is part of the problem we've got with modern media, that there are fewer of them. I give you that. And they're trying to feed more platforms. So they're busy. Yeah. But you still, no matter how busy you are in a given day, you have to do your homework. Mm -hmm. I have to do it for my work. I can't walk into a committee meeting and waste people's time by asking a bunch of stupid, ill-informed questions uh, when we have people who are volunteering their time to talk. But I beg the reporters and the journalists, and there are many who are very sensitive and good about this, but it's not just your daily hit from somebody who has no history with the issue to come in and conclude. This is a nuanced, uh, you have to be able to understand Supreme Court rulings. You've got to understand the criminal code. You've got to understand medical ethics. You've got to know there's a difference between palliative care and medical assistance and dying and suicide. And these are all very different things. And you can't just walk in and think you can pick it up. So I'm troubled by that. And we've seen stories in the recent past about veterans, you know, going in and saying my circumstances are bad and I'm suffering from PTSD and I can't find a place to live. 
if there was a rogue person who said you might as well just end it all then, then all we can hope is that that person is fired summarily. Just the, that's the worst advice in the world. But to invoke that somehow made is a solution for that is dangerous and absurd because it Agreed. could never be a solution to that. You referred to our conversation with Stephanie. This is a woman who runs the organization. Medical professionals, they spend every waking minute. Honestly, these people do this all of their own time and heart to to set out the conditions to help one another. Stephanie's written a book, others have written books to help one another figure out the nuances of this. When a patient says, I really want to end my life, why are they saying that? What has brought them to that point? Is there other treatment or support they could find? Do they just want to reconnect with family? This is a very, very sensitive and important thing. So we need to have the discussion of it, be intelligent and reasoned and informed, most importantly. Absolutely. And as the daughter of a late journalist, I really hear what you're sharing. I think, though, to just use a, an example of CBC's The Current with Matt Galloway had on a guest recently uh, who really talked about wanting true choice and wanting peace to have the right to end her life the way she chose. What do you think will give Canadians the greatest peace of mind when they are able to consider what the end of their own life will look like, Pamela? I have a good friend. His name is Ron Posno. He is about 80. He has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and we've been conversing. He's been on my podcast. We talk regularly every time there's a development on this front. He's talked about this and my own family did as well. It is that peace of mind, Carolyn, that you talk about, which is I want to be able to plan it. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to befall me. I don't know where I'm going to be living when I'm 85 and under what circumstances and how much money I'll have and where my family will be. I want to make some decisions now that will give me peace of mind that I can talk to my friends and my family about and give them peace of mind. I mean, my sister and I have this conversation. We have it with her children and we talk about this, which is, you know, you, you've got to know where we're coming from on this issue. And you remember grandma and grandpa and going through these discussions. So I feel this so strongly because my parents said it to me. They wanted to live as the people they were. And when that possibility no longer exists, then they want to be able to, of free will and choice, bring that part to an end, have a chance. I just went through this with a, a good friend of mine. She had been a neighbor for many, many years, and she was partly caught in the COVID problem of not seeing your doctor often enough. And she'd had cancer before. And by the time she got this diagnosis, there was nothing they could do. So she called me on the phone to tell me about the diagnosis. And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, I want to do that thing you're on about in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she said, where do I start? And I said, well, you start with your doctors right then and there. You say that this is something you'd like to discuss and you have to find out if they're in agreement, you know, if they feel comfortable with this, otherwise they're going to have to make a referral to someone else. And I said, and I know lots of people that we can discuss this with and we will. But she was just so clear. And then she set about and we all had a very nice Thanksgiving gathering and had all the turkey and all the fixings on the main floor of her own home where she was. And people went up and visited and said their final goodbyes and then some of us were in the room again the next morning when the procedure was about to begin and I actually saw that on her face she had come to this part she did not want the horrible end that stage four cancer can impose upon you she had been surrounded by friends she'd said everything that she wanted to say and the doctor said you know, they must ask in the, the last seconds if you want to proceed with this and do you want these people in the room? And 
And she had always been very flamboyant and dramatic. And she said, yes, I want them all in the room. And I want them to hear as I say, goodbye. <laughs> and, <laughs> no. She got to shape and choose her departure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of us, we don't have a chance to say goodbye to our friends. You know, they live somewhere else and you get a call late at night and uh, someone says, do you know, you know, so-and-so passed away? Well, no. And, you know, it, it's, it's so frustrating. So to actually see somebody like that, she'd lived a wonderful life, choose her own departure and be surrounded with people she loved and, and, and we all loved her. It was just, it was so reassuring. And afterwards, I just sat with her for a bit and just held her hand. Um, you know, as, as she was departing, we never know, we don't know what goes on on the, <laughs> the other side of this, but it was, I hope comfort for her. And it was certainly comfort for me. And I just think that that's what we look for. When I talked to Ron about this, as somebody who is losing capacity bit by bit by bit, and who is aware of that diminished capacity, he wants it settled. Exactly. He wants it settled. Yep. So yeah. it's not leaving friends and family, you know, wondering what to do and feeling concerned for him. And then he could sit down and go more gently into that good night or the process of dementia. There's a lot of time when you have dementia or Alzheimer's in which you're quite enjoying your time. Yeah. But it's another one of the myths we have to deal with, which is the happy dementia, which is much further down the road where you know, you're sitting in a senior's residence and they bring the music in and people are tapping their toes. Um, they may at that moment appear content, but if you have family members there, or if you work in those homes or institutions, you know that 30 seconds later, it may not be so happy. We have to get that out of our heads that just letting people live in some other world is not and would not be their choice. And when people have said that to you over years and years and years, which is that's not my definition of life. Uh, so please don't let me go there. It does motivate you to take on these issues, things like advanced requests, as complicated as they are, we need to give people that comfort. Absolutely. And listening to you speak of your friends in particular, Kathy and I have done a lot of work in this area and a lot of research and studies with people and one thing we hear is the appreciation to be able to cultivate or orchestrate those moments before the MAID procedure. But also, Pamela, what we've been so cognizant when we hear is that the grief that results after these things, and you touched on it a little bit, holding the hand of your friend and being there um, as she transitioned or, or whatever was to come for her, it helps healthy grief occur for those who are left behind. So how wonderful to think that not only is the dying person afforded these opportunities to orchestrate the kind of leaving that they're doing, but those of us left behind have that peace of mind, as we've discussed, because we have the ability to look at one another and say, she went out the way she wanted. And we knew that. I think this is hugely important. I mean, we've all been struggling with this, uh, particularly through COVID, right, where you could not go through the kinds of rituals that we are used to going through, which is going to funerals and sitting with one another and having coffee and cake afterwards and telling great stories. And so we are finding now other ways to do that, but we realize, and I think it became in sharp relief in those situations that we need our time yeah. to deal with losing loved ones. I mean, Absolutely. of course we don't know that, but, but a funeral is not enough. What really gives us peace as those left behind the grievors is knowing that the person who has gone made a choice was at peace 
it's wow. there's enough people in our life that we lose due to circumstances beyond anybody's control. There's a tragic accident. There's a massive heart attack and nobody saw it coming and there was no time to resolve. But I think that's why the more we have this discussion in public with one another and make it more comfortable, we should be having those discussions. We don't know if we're going to be struck by lightning. So let's have that discussion as kind of an ongoing part of life. I don't want to be morbid and make all 12 year olds sit down and <laughs> talk about their end of life strategy. But I do. You know, <laughs> when you get to middle age, you know, there's uh, it's a reasonable conversation to be Absolutely. having and, and yeah. making it more normal. Um, yes. And I find that like I go to dinner parties with friends and they, you know, somebody asks the innocent question. So what are you working on? Working on. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, really, my uh, I'm really focused on maid medical. <laughs> dying. And then there's either yeah. like awkward silence <laughs> or everybody at the table talks at once and says oh my god can I, I have so many questions can I ask you about this can I ask you about that they genuinely want information and unfortunately we have to take that on ourselves it's our own responsibility nobody's going to yeah. deliver it in the mail so you have to talk to your doctors you have to go online you have to find the end of life kind of system. There's lots of documentation lots of online that you can take home, look at it either privately by yourself or with others and start to think about it and start to write some things down. Um, I was talking to a, a maid provider that I know and, and she said it's so helpful for them if people have left a track record mm -hmm. uh, with their friends and with their family, people who can say, oh, yes, I had that conversation with her 20 years ago. She was most intent. And actually, we had it again last week. And so I said to this woman, I said, does giving speeches in the Senate and putting <laughs> legislation count <laughs> yeah, as making my point of view clear? Because well, this, is on some record. Level, <laughs> this is at some level very personal for us too. And I want, yes. I want to oh. be able to have this choice myself, particularly as the daughter of um, a mother and a grandmother who died of Alzheimer's. So, you know, I need to take this on board. Yeah, yeah. And it does seem like a personal piece in addition, because we are all going to die. And Carolyn mentioned some of the research that we were doing. And as you were speaking earlier about your friend's death and being able to have that sense of control, to be able to give everybody a big kiss as the send off, I was reminded of some of the stories that we heard a couple of years ago, where people who had accompanied someone who used maid at the end of their life, they were still a little bit concerned about the things that they had to make sure were in place that I think your bill is going to help with because people were worried they couldn't take all their pain medication in case somebody wasn't able or didn't have the capacity to give that last moment of consent or have that last big glass of gin on the rocks, you know, to salute life, a life well lived because of that need for capacity. And so I think your bill around advanced requests will assist that alongside, as you're saying, people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I think it's really, well, I mean, obviously, I think it's important. That's why I'm trying to do it. That's why I'm so glad that Quebec legislature is doing this as well, the assembly, because their approach is slightly different and I'm not wedded to any of it. I want us to go forward and figure out the details. And if somebody tells me that you should rewrite your advanced consent, I'm going to use that phrase, advanced request. You know, if you want to call me every six months, call me every six months. If you want to call me once every five years, I'm fine with any of it. Whatever gives the most people comfort, let's try and do that and put that in a system it makes life easier for the doctors as well certainly and most importantly makes life easier for the person who's choosing made but for their family caregiver because, yep you yep. know those there's always a lot of difference nobody wants to let mom go nobody wants to say goodbye to you know sister susie because <laughs> 
you know, she's too young and we shouldn't have to do it. But we always have to keep in the back of our mind that it's about them. It's not about us. Absolutely. Kathy and I were very interested, too, with the Quebec Bill uh, C-11, I believe. One of the components was, of course, the removal of institutions, hospices and palliative care spaces to refuse to have the procedure done. And that was something that you discussed again in your own podcast. But that's something that I think we were interested to see because, to go back to that term you use, the comfort of the person who's choosing MAID and their caregiver, their family, their loved ones, having to move a dying person to another locale seems like... Um, Torture. The, absolutely. And so... Moving forward, I think we're seeing legislation that really is starting to think about the person within the legislation. And that is really, really key. You know, we've got to make it doable for people in their own homes. We Mm -hmm. need to see there are things like Maid House, you know, organizations that are trying to create kind of a hospice space where you can go and do it. To see this in seniors' residences and seniors' communities would be very important. And then again, it could be kind of outside the home, the individual home, but there where it's close and accessible to people. And it also has the added benefit, in my mind, of really making it more normal. Um, Yes. Yes. People are going to pass away, particularly when they're at the advanced age. And if it's illness that strikes them quickly, that's one thing. And if it's a choice of made because the illness is fast approaching, then let's just deal with that and let's make it as easy and comfortable for the person as we can. As you say this, and we've all read these stories of people having to be transported out of a hospital hooked up to wires and this and that and transported to another location or a hospital without religious objection or those kinds of things. We just have to get past that as soon as we can. And I think the Quebec bill does focus in on that. And you can have different staff members or different parts of the facility if people want to stay separate because of their own personal beliefs. I mean, I don't want to impose this on anybody. I'm not saying, you know, you have to do this because I choose to do it. I'm saying, just let me make my choice and I will let you make yours. There's no issue here. Um, So we just have to accommodate both sides of that. And there may be medical professionals that don't want to participate or do not want to bear witness. Please, Let's not make anybody do something against their will. Let us find others, and there'll be volunteers in any institution who will say, I'll stand up. I'll be here. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We just, we have to just talk to one another like normal human beings. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have to normalize and socialize the discussion. And ideally, we will all have opportunity to make that choice for ourselves at the end of life. That's, I think, what we're all looking about that. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, we all go to grocery stores and we get to make choices every day about what we're going to have for supper and, you know, this lettuce or that lettuce. And we look at the wallet and decide what we should do. We can afford. (laughs) There's always a lot of factors that go into every decision. And this is the difference. And and the more we don't make it scary or uncomfortable, um, the, the better it will be regardless of what people choose in the end. I mean, people may go through the whole process and say, you know what, just not for me. Okay. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's a thousand percent. Okay. There's just yes. not a problem with that, but, but educate yourself because in the process that, you know, that may be the husband in the couple that says, no, I don't want to do that. But the wife has said, you know, I didn't think I did. But now I do. Even at the beginning, I remember having this conversation about cremation versus burial with my parents long before any maid was even a thought in any mind. And, (laughs) you know, it was kind of funny, but, you know, dad wanted to be cremated and sort of thrown to the ashes because he was an outdoor guy. Mom wanted to be buried. And and it was kind of funny at the supper table. And mom said, okay, well, you can be cremated then, but can I have some of your ashes to be with me? And dad said, 
sure, we'll do it that way. <laughs> it was nice. It was their little compromise. But again, as I said earlier, it was sort of a gift to my sister and I to see that yeah. they had such ease with it. Mm -hmm. And that as, you know, as we proceeded in life, that we should make that as easy for those around us too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your gift of time today, Pamela. Such an honor. Thank you so much. Well, it's great. And keep on doing the work and keep on doing the research. And we'll keep on having these discussions. And as I say, I know Canadians are there in such large numbers. And I think it's time that we listened and that we heard. Agreed. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Thank you so very much. Thank you so My very pleasure. much. Bye-bye now. Can you believe we got to speak to Senator Pamela Wallen? Wow. I was right to have a bit of a restless night. That was that was incredible. What a privilege. What a pleasure. The advocacy, the time, and the energy that she has put in towards making sure Canadians have choice at the end of their life is amazing and inspiring. And I, I really appreciated how she exemplifies this idea that the personal is political. Mm -hmm. That for her, if she wants to have choice at the end of her life, she needs to spend the currency of her privilege and work within the political system. What I really loved was that phrase, just let me make my choice and I'll let you make yours. And what I appreciated about that was the flexibility to work within that realm to say, there's no force on, on either side, but choice is about affording that choice and not denying a choice in those kinds of instances. So no, just so much there. And uh, I really appreciated how we got to discuss uh, large topics that are vital to be discussed. And on a macro level, but also talking about why it matters at the bedside, why Absolutely. it matters to us as women, as members of families. And of course, we got to talk a little bit about the importance of making sure that young people have these conversations too. Yes. And being from Weyburn, Saskatchewan, a real sense that she understands where so many of us are coming in terms of being rural and remote in this country, that we're not all situated in those major urban centers uh, and might not necessarily have the kind of access that's afforded to people in those spaces. So just incredible. On that note, if you liked what you heard and you appreciated our conversation with Senator Wallen and would like to join us for the next episode, consider subscribing to our podcast or giving us a like on wherever you get your podcast. We'd really appreciate it. It helps us understand that you as Canadians or otherwise are interested in the things that we have to conversate about. And if there's somebody in particular that you think we should be chatting with, please don't hesitate to send us an email at disruptingdeathmade at gmail.com. So let's keep those conversations going. Did we?